so I think the only reason we get a prominent mention of Essenes is because of Josephus' personal history. It's a difficult question to answer because Christianity seems to be similar to a lot of sects. It, like I was mentioning in another clip, uh, Hillelite Phariseeism is almost identical to Jesus' teaching. So it's like talking to the Christian and telling them about the actual historical Jesus. If you approach it, yeah. it's like, no, we're, we want the Christ. Or your yeah. average Jehovah's Witness and you want to explain to them Lutheranism as the original Protestantism. And they're like, well, the, the average Jehovah's Witness is not going to know anything about that, and nor care. Uh, yeah. It's not relevant. Well, Luther's wrong, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Catholics are wrong too, it doesn't matter. We, we got our own thing, we have our own revelations, etc. Dr. Richard Carrier, I've got a question from one of my Patreon members, David Bacotti. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Hello, Derek. Thanks for the great content from subjects to guest. I have a question or related questions. Were the Essenes the most likely progenitors of early Christians? Why aren't the Essenes mentioned in the New Testament unless the references to the poor, the way, and saints are references to them? Why do the Essenes seem to evaporate just as Christianity begins to precipitate? Thanks again. Ah, yeah. So, uh, I think the Essenes were a much smaller sect than the Sadducees, and much less influential sect than the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Um, the only reason they get prominent mention is because Josephus decides to include them in his list of the top sects. Uh, and he, but he includes in the top sects, the four sects, he includes the Zealots, basically, um, which he calls the fourth way. But... Uh, so, but I think that's because Josephus himself dabbled in Essenism, uh, and I think he still has some sympathies with Essenism, even though he himself is a Pharisee. Um, w weirdly, because he's also it was a priest in the temple, so he's he's which were normally Sadducees. So it's <laughs> Josephus has an interesting uh, story, but he sampled all these sects and bounced around them. Uh, so I think the only reason we get a prominent mention of Essenes is because Josephus's personal history. I think the sect itself is quite small, and so I think in the Gospels. And also the Gospels are written after the war. So this is another important thing. After the war, uh, a lot of this stuff died out. Um, the Sadducees were a thing of the past, basically, because uh, they, they were so invested in the temple sect. The temple's gone. So that sect was pretty much just devastated. The Pharisees were the ones who sur mainly survived and especially were the more popular in the diaspora and could continue. Uh, I don't know how popular Essenism actually was among the diaspora, and in Judea, everything got laid waste. So, so I think Essenism kind of basically died out uh, through the circumstances of war and politics of the time. So when the Gospels are being written, the authors aren't even necessarily all that familiar with Essenes because there aren't a lot of Essenes around, certainly not in the diaspora. They're familiar with the, the traditional two sects that, that argued with each other, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Those are the sects that they know a lot about. Those are the po more popular, more famous sects. So that's why those sects show up in the Gospels. Um, so I don't think we can infer that, for example, Jesus represents the Essenes. Um, were that the case, they would just say it. Uh, and we don't have any... It's possible, though, but it, it, it's not directly stated, so we can't make that inference. Um, and the other aspect of that question is, uh, to what extent is Christianity an Essene? Um, and it's a difficult question to answer because Christianity seems to be similar to a lot of sects. It, like I was mentioning in another clip, uh, Hillelite Phariseeism is almost identical to Jesus' teaching. So, so Jesus seems to be a Hillelite Pharisee, right? Uh, uh, and that's a thing that wouldn't be obvious to someone who's reading the Gospels and doesn't know the context, because the Pharisees in there uh, are always actually Shammaites, but they're never said to be. They're just, it's like the idea of the existence of Hillelite Pharisees is erased from the text. Uh, it's not there, and the, the only way it is there is in the voice of Jesus, right? Uh, Jesus is a little bit more conservative than Hillel in some points, but most of what he's arguing is Hillelite Phariseeism. Uh, so I think whoever's writing these texts is sim oversimplifying the reality, because they're, they're thinking, well, we're going to use Pharisees as sort of the old moniker for the old conservative Shammite religion, um, and then we're going to have Jesus as our representative of Hillelite Phariseeism. They wouldn't necessarily have called it that, right? They would, they would know, oh, yeah, this is closer to the teachings of Hillel, closer to the, and Hillel happened to be a Pharisee, yada, yada. They would see it as their own way. It's their own sect. They're not Pharisees. They're their own thing. They're actually rebelling against Phariseeism, even though most of their ideas are coming from the liberal wing of Phariseeism. But there's a lot of stuff in Jesus that's put in the mouth of Jesus, and we find in the letters of Paul, that very much resembles the Essenes. 
And also there's a lot of overlap between that, the Essenes, and the Dead Sea sect. Uh, so a lot of people, a lot of scholars have suggested that the Dead Sea sect, if it was one sect, it might even been the stash of documents from multiple sects for all we know. But even if it was one sect, it does seem to be related to the Essenes. Now, if you go looking through the literature and the, the ancient discussions of the Essenes, there is a definite assumption at the time that the Essenes were an offshoot of the Samaritans, which is an interesting, if you, if you look at that, then that pulls in Samaritanism. And there are other people who have suggested there's aspects of Samaritanism in Jesus' teaching too. Uh, and so like this gets really complicated uh, and I don't think we can really nail it down. I think there's multiple influences coming in. They're doing their own thing. Uh, the one place where you, where you could hope to nail it down, but we can't because the sources are gone, would be what, what, sect was it before it was Christian, right? Because we have like the First Corinthians 15, it says, you know, uh, Jesus, then Jesus appeared to Cephas and the 12. And we know there was a 12 in the Dead Sea sect. Uh, it was representing because they were, they were the countercultural sect. They were anti-temple. They were uh, setting us, they're creating their own, makes uh, the survivalist community uh, and setting up their own government uh, to represent the true government. And they had their own quorum of 12 who presumably would replace the leadership of the 12 tribes in the end times because the temple cult's going to get destroyed by God because they fuck those guys, basically. Um, so, so we know they had these quorums of 12. This was a, an aspect of these countercultural sects. So it looks like there was already Kephos heading a quorum of 12 for his own sect before he had this vision that said, the end times are now. It's happening. Jesus has just atoned for all sins. That solved the problem. Now he's, he's res he said he's resurrected from the dead. So the resurrection has begun. The end times has begun. So I think there was a sect already that wasn't Christian that, that became or broke off from that to become Christian. Kephas and his committee of 12 just re realigned it to this new apocalyptic movement, right? So what was that sect? Uh, and I do suspect it was probably a branch of the Essenes, but it might have had a lot of Pharisee influence. And so it might have been, you know, they, would, they might have been an offshoot of the Pharisees in the same way that the Dead Sea sect is. They're like cousins. Um, but they're getting, they see themselves as independent. They're their own thing. And so there might've been a lot of Pharisee influence that they're adopting similar perspectives. Uh, and so that's what I suspect. Now we can't prove any of this because all the source information that we would need is gone. We can't go talk to Peter and say, Hey, what, what would you have called yourself before you had this revelation? You know? Right. Um, so we don't know really. And then there's a difference between the, the sect as Paul knows it, right? The sect that Paul joins. And the Gospels, right? Each Gospel is writing for a different community that's evolved considerably since then. It's all post-war, so there's, everything's changed by then. So Essenism is no longer relevant. It's no longer salient to their uh, cultural milieu. Uh, so that's why it's not going to come up. Uh, even, if, even if there were connections with Essenism, they might not have even known that by that point, right? They, there's, there's no sign that they actually have a good sense of their own history. Uh, when they're writing these documents. They're, they're, and they're not even interested in that, really. They're interested in looking to the future. They're, they're writing for the future in their present community. History, I know historicists and especially Christian apologists want this to be, they want them to be historically conscious and they want them to care about history. I don't think that's what they're doing in these Gospels. Uh, I don't think they think that they're writing history. I think they think they're writing parables that will be useful for teaching in their present community. And so his, what is historically true is less interesting to them. They're not researching that. They don't care because it's not relevant to what they're doing. They want, they're speaking to the future and the present. And they're going to tell stories, whatever stories they need to tell, true or false, to do that. So researching their own history, uh, you know, figuring, oh, we used to, we descend from Essenism. That wouldn't even be, uh, that would be not even interest them, that research. It, it yeah. would be irrelevant to what their project is. It's like talking to the Christian and telling them about the actual historical Jesus. If you approach it, yeah. it's like, no, we're, we want the Christ. Or your yeah. average Jehovah's Witness and you want to explain to them Lutheranism as the original Protestantism and they're like, well, the, the average Jehovah's Witness is not going to know anything about that and nor care. Uh, yeah. It's not relevant. Well, Luther's wrong, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Catholics are wrong too, it doesn't matter. We, we got our own thing, we have our own revelations, etc. Right. Uh, so, <clears throat> and yeah, they very much see themselves as the true Christianity all, everybody else is corrupt in some fashion or other. Even the sects out of which they well, th themselves. This begs the question, just to finally wrap up this particular one is, we always have the question of, was, was, did Christianity start with this one thing and then just sh spread off into these fractions mm -hmm. so different, too, that it's hard to believe that they would even have come from this one mm -hmm. Jerusalem sect of Essene slash Pharisee type Christians? W what do you think of this? Because this, to me... Uh, 
actually bolsters the mythicist claim a little bit that if to there were multiple movements, multiple parallel. heavenly <coughs> figure yeah. type. Um, cult. I mean, Earl Doherty's pushed that, right? That's uh, and and I think Earl Doherty does good work generally. Uh, this, I think, it, it's going beyond the evidence, right? Right. Um, I think the evidence is pretty clear that this is a nuclear Big Bang version of events. Kefas had this revelation, and that started everything rolling. The ball started then. Um, there wasn't a Jesus before that. Uh, right. Or insofar as there was, it was this angelic figure that was just part of their angel angelology. It wasn't like a central figure for them. Um, so I think Peter's the one who's starting all of this, and everything, everything snowballs from there. And then it just quickly, uh, people spin off. It gets so popular. So you have, Paul's already talking about deviate, people deviating from the original mm -hmm. gospel and stuff like that. But it's clear Paul is perfectly aware that the, the religion started with Kephos. There was no Christianity before that. But what about and James? everything else... Isn't he under James, supposedly? Well, see, that's that's a modern anachronism. There, there actually is no actual evidence for a Jamesian Christianity. This is this is largely a construct of modern scholarship. Um, there is some er, like uh, fourth century uh, examples of people talking about a j supposed Jamesian Christianity, but there's no evidence of it in the New Testament. There's no evidence of it even well into the second century. Um, you have to get way late second century to even have significant legends about James that even make him a prominent person. Like, there's no James who's significant in the book of Acts. I was thinking uh, Galatians. Other than the ones who are part of the same sect. They're followers of Peter. Um, so, uh, and, and Galatians too. Like, it's, clearly it's the pillars. These are the same figures that are part of the same nuclear origin under Kephos. So there's no separate Jamesian movement. Um, even when James is criticizing Peter in Galatians, there, it's, it, this is internal uh, you mean Paul, debate. Paul. Uh, no, no, he, there's... James is... Yeah, because Paul talks about how James got mad at Peter for uh, shirking a little bit on Torah observance. And Paul's, of course, trying to solve this by saying, no, no well, let's just, let's have Peter stick with the Jews and I'll be the one who does to the Gentiles and to try and reconcile this argument that is built up amongst the, the pillars. Uh, but the pillars are still part of the same movement. They're not a separate thing. Um, so uh, James, including among them. So they're equal on... We're, at the very well, least, it, it we can't seems tell. If that there's... The way they talk, the way Paul talks about it, is that Kephas is kind of the. It's more egalitarian. It's kind of a commune. So there's not like there is a pope. Right. It's not that way. It's just, it's it's just we're all community, and the apostles is the highest rank. There's no leading apostle. Um, but it, in as as people will talk about, there there's literal hierarchy, and then there's de facto hierarchy, and I think the de facto hierarchy is that that people were would look to Peter as the highest ranking apostle. Now that didn't, that wasn't an official position. That wasn't something he could claim. I'm the highest apostle. So you should listen to me. It's just, he had the most influence because he's the first revelator. Um, mm. But you see the pillars do seem to be the higher ranking. There's very clearly these three, John, James, and Peter were very much regarded as the leaders of the church. Everybody else underranked them in some fashion for some reason. I do think that's it's very clear in Paul Paul's saying that Peter to the gen, to the uncircumcised, like, he is the leader in a sense of this, and Paul's minded, and not not leader, no, but he's Paul's like trying the... to find a position for himself to have authority. Right. He's trying to divide up the fiefdoms. He's trying to prevent this internecine war within the sect. There's there's a lot of political shit that Paul is doing with that. Yeah. Uh, and it makes sense for, for Paul to do this. Yeah. Um, but the egalitarianism of the movement allows Paul to do this. This is a, why why he can't. Kephas just can't say no. I'm the lead apostle. You do what I say. He can't do that because it's too egalitarian. It's too communistic. Uh, the original sect at this time. Wow. But to get back to your original question, the multiple versions, I think like, there is a truth, as you said, that if that were the case, uh, that would strongly support, that would give a support, uh, not necessarily strong, but definitely a support to mythicism because you can make a case, and I, don't, I do not, contrary to what people have claimed, I do not claim that we can prove this, but there is evidence of this, which is that there was always this Je Jesus angelology that the figure that, that Kephas suddenly had the revelation that he had acquired a body, died, and risen, all this new information, suddenly everything's changed, that figure was already a significant fi figure in their angelology. So they already had a Jesus angel. Uh, it just means Joshua, Savior of God, and it's a particular angel that Philo identifies as the angel of many names. I think Philo even specifically thought that it was named Jesus. Now that's a debatable point because it hinges on how Philo is interpreting the text that he's talking about, yada, yada. But definitely Paul and the first Christians did believe that. They did believe that their Jesus was the same angel as the angel of our many names, whether Philo knew him under the name Jesus or not. But if he did, and Philo is like we're talking 20s AD, right? 
um, if, and Philo might be referring to angelology that's developed long before him. So there may have been many sects that, that would talk, have conversations and talk about Jesus as the Savior of God, the voice piece of God, etc., the Son of God. They would call him the Son of God. They would have called him the Creator. Uh, they would have called him uh, the image of God. Um, uh, they would have called him the Logos, even. Uh, Paul would have known him. Even though Paul never calls him the Logos, he would have recognized that as an identifying figure for G his Jesus. So there could be multiple movements in which you would find literature where they're talking about a Jesus figure um, before you even get to any belief that this Jesus figure became a human, died, and rose from Gospels, dead. Gospels, pretty much. So, yeah. so when we're talking about Christianity, we're talking about that. The, the sudden revelation that he took on a body, he came down, took on a body, a mortal body, died, and rose from the dead. That's Christianity. Everything else is just other sects. But that's Christianity, and so that was a singular event. Someone came up with that one innovation, and that almost certainly by all the evidence we have was Kephas, and everything after that was iterations and riffing on the thing that he invented. Wow. Uh, and so I think the evidence is pretty strong on that. Uh, if we could find more evidence of parallel Jesus movements, I could say more about this, but we, the evidence is really scant, really speculative. It's not solid enough to work with. So I would love to have it. Uh, because it would inform us a lot more about where Christianity came from and what figure it was talking about when it started. But um, I just the evidence is not strong enough to convince me to use it as a premise. So, Ladies and gentlemen, join MythVision's Patreon not only to support us, but there are 72 videos that I did with Dr. Dennis R. McDonald and Richard Carrier all on the Patreon, early access. You guys can ask personal questions when I go to interview these scholars and you're helping MythVision grow.